Cryofibril is one of the most complex and advanced components of the nano suit, giving the wearer unsurpassed physical performance and protection on the battlefield when compared to other artificial muscle systems. It also functions as a medium for the nano suit's modal functions, such as the cloak ability. But is it possible? Can we make something like this? Or does something like this already exist? Let's explore. Cryfibril was first used to great effect in the Nanosuit 1.0 and set the standard for all other nanosuits, the four modes radial system being the greatest. With it, the operator could run faster, jump higher and hit harder than any human alive, thus performing at superhuman levels. It was soon after copied by other companies and governments, most notably being the North Koreans and their nanosuits, but all of their iterations were inferior compared to Crynet's. It has since then undergone a series of significant upgrades, most notably those within the Crynet Nanosuit 2, where the upgraded Cryfibril became twice as light, 32% stronger, and gained 20% more energy storage capacity. The ability to extract energy via solar, radiation, kinetic, and through carbon released by carrion. The newest version of Cryfibril supports a dark blue colour compared to the pure black found on the older version. The Cryfibril also powers the second system utilised by the Nanosuit 2. It is apparent that Cryfibril is able to fuse and bond with the human body as shown and mentioned in Crisis 2 and Crisis Legion when Alcatraz suffers fatal wounds at the beginning of the game, shortly before being rescued by Prophet and given the Nanosuit. Later on, when the Nanosuit is being scanned, it is shown to have bonded with Alcatraz's body through the wounds. The cryofibril is mentioned at the beginning as being semi-organic, or having a semi-organic component to the armour, suggesting it could be alive, or simply replicates biological properties. Well, we need to break this down. Cryofibril has several properties that we can explore. 1. Artificial muscle. 2. Flexible armour. 3. Cloaking capabilities. 4. Biological interaction. And 5. Energy harvesting. So let's go step by step and figure out each step of this process. Maximum power. Cryfibril has an electromechanical coupling that exceeds 70% under most battlefield conditions. The suit can generate up to 450 newtons of force and up to 10,000 g of contractile acceleration for each centimeter cubed of cryfibril. This allows feats which require massive power to be performed with little to no effort at all such as pushing a fully loaded fuel wagon which has stood on top of rusted rails for years. Prophet was also able to break a wooden door into splinters and send it flying after kicking it with little to no effort. This implies that with further experience, the Nanosuit 2's maximum strength can become limitless. Do we have something like this in real life? Well, an ionic polymer metal composite is a synthetic composite nanomaterial that displays artificial muscle behaviour under an applied voltage or electric field. IPMCs are composed of an ionic polymer like Nafion or Flemion, whose surfaces are chemically plated or physically coated with conductors such as platinum or gold. Under an applied voltage of between 1 to 5 volts for a typical sample of 10mm by 40mm by 0.2mm samples, ion migration and redistribution due to the imposed voltage across the strip of IPMCs resulting in a bending deformation. If the plated electrode are arranged in a non-symmetric configuration, the imposed voltage can induce all kinds of deformations. Alternatively, if such deformations are physically applied to an IPMC strip, they generate a voltage output, only a few millivolts for typical small samples, as sensors and NG harvesters. IPMCs are a type of electroactive polymer, and they work very well in liquid environments as well as in air. They have a force density of about 40 in a cantilever configuration, meaning that they can generate a tip force of almost 40 times their own weight in a cantilever mode. IPMCs in actuation, sensing and energy harvesting have very broad bandwidths to kilohertz and higher. But we'll get to that shortly. So we've already established that artificial muscles, the artificial muscle component of cryfibril, already very much exists. Maximum armor. Energy is diverted to tightening the suit's outer weave, increasing density and thus enabling deflection of oncoming high-speed projectiles, blunt trauma and high-energy emissions are also absorbed. 
Cryfibal appears to be able to operate like a body armor, able to harden against incoming projectiles, thus negating the penetrative and kinetic impacts of rounds. Again, we demonstrably have materials that can already do this. A dilatant is a non-Newtonian fluid where the shear thickening viscosity increases with applied shear stress. This behavior is only one type of deviation from Newton's law, and it is controlled by such factors as particle size, shape, and distribution. The properties of these suspensions depend on the Haymaker theory and the van der Waals forces and can be stabilized electrostatically or sterically. Shear thickening behavior occurs when a colloidal suspension transitions from a stable state to a state of flocculation. A large portion of the properties of these systems are due to the surface chemistry of particles in suspension, known as colloids. Due to cryofibril's electroactive properties, however, the dilatant element of the composite aligns more accurately to electrostatically stabilized suspensions. Suspensions of similarly charged particles dispersed in a liquid electrolyte are stabilized through an effect described by the Helmholtz double layer model. The model has two layers. The first layer is the charged surface of the particle, which creates an electrostatic field that affects the ions in the electrolyte. In response, the ions create a diffuse layer of equal and opposite charge, effectively rendering the surface charge neutral. However, the diffuse layer creates a potential surrounding the particle that differs from the bulk electrolyte. The diffuse layers serve as the long-range force for stabilization of the particles. When particles draw near to one another, the diffuse layer of one particle overlaps with that of the other particle, generating a repulsive force. Such a system could allow the wearer flexibility for a normal range of movement, yet provide rigidity to resist piercing by bullets, stabbing knife blows, and similar attacks. The principle is similar to that of male armor, though body armor using a dilatant would be much lighter. The dilatant fluid would disperse the force of a sudden blow over a wider area of the user's body, reducing the blunt force trauma. However, a slow attack, which would allow the flow to occur such as a slow but forceful stab, the dilatant would not provide any additional protection. In one study, standard Kevlar fabric was compared to a composite armour of Kevlar and a proprietary shear thickening fluid. The result showed that the Kevlar fluid combination performed better than the pure Kevlar material, despite having less than one-third the Kevlar thickness. So what's next? Cloak engaged. The suit's surface dynamically scans the surrounding area and modifies its skin colour to match in real time, cloaking the user in addition to trapping most vibrations or sound produced by movement. Note that firing a shot from an unsuppressed firearm while cloaked will fully deplete the suit's energy reserve, while doing so with a suppressed firearm will maximise power consumption, but while still disrupting the system. As such, it is strongly advised to shoot for a target's weak spot while cloaked and remain hidden to reduce overall chances of detection. The suit will also temporarily deactivate the field if the user strikes an enemy, picks up an item or enemy, or performs a stealth kill. Afterward, it automatically resumes. A closer look reveals a spectrum caused by the formation of light-refracting nanocrystals. This likely lends to the ability to be able to bend light around the wearer. Light moving from a source to the nanosuit and then bouncing off into the eye of an observer, it would instead be bent by these nanocrystals, meaning rather than allowing the photons of light to bounce back to the observer, the light would be redirected and channeled around the suit, meaning negligible light actually rebounds and makes it to the retina of the observer, rendering the suit nearly entirely invisible. But do we have materials that can do this? In long... No, not quite the same way, but in short, yes. There exist a few emergent solid-state materials that are currently in use as a form of optical cloaking. The most prominent at this time is the invisibility shield developed by Hyperstealth, which uses lenticular lenses to bend light around objects immediately behind the shield. This is functionally very similar to what the nanosuit can do, and there's even some rather impressive innovations in using camera pass-throughs where very small cameras image the scene behind the object you wish to obscure and a very large, very high definition screen displays that camera view in the same aspect ratio giving the illusion that the object isn't even there. There is still a long way to go to perfect both of these technologies but it stands to reason that with innovations in the field we might not be that far away from materials you can clad an object with that will mask its appearance at the will of the operator. And that's only mentioning two specific permutations of this technology that immediately jumps to mind. I'm also vaguely aware of an optical cloaking for the infrared radio wave and x-rays, as I recall, that all allows the signature of an object in those specific spectrums to be masked to an observer, 
There are others that appear to be like the invisibility cloak from Harry Potter, but you'll find that more often than not, it's just as it was in the movies, that these cloaks are actually just green screen cloaks that are edited out in post-production. So, a way to go, but we are already making big strides in the right direction. Moving on. Nanospore infestation. Filtering. All nanosuits are symbiotic, meaning that they physically bond with the user and become a form of second skin, unless prevented so by an inner suit. The suits and the users eventually merge into one being. The process is accelerated if the wearer suffers serious injury and the suit will break down non-critical tissues in order to repair critical organs. Over time, the suit would also directly interface with the wearer's brain. This allows the wearer to use the suit's processors as a part of their own brain, essentially making most of their thought processes happen outside of their own brain. The wearer's personality and memories would also be copied and stored in the suit's deep layers. Once fully merged, the wearer no longer appears to wear the suit, but has access to all suit functions. They become a post-human warrior. The suit is also capable of seeping into any wound and fix it at an incredibly drastic rate, as seen in the case of Alcatraz, whose damaged lungs were fixed, albeit at the cost of his larynx and the suit permanently bonding into its body, and that, and that imminent death would occur due to the fact that his lungs became dependent on the suit's repairing systems forever. Because of these features, it is implied that the nanosuit is not only capable of being a life support system, but also capable of permanently immunizing its wearers from all toxins, venoms, and diseases of all forms known and unknown, biological or human-made. This also implies that the suit has a regenerative healing factor unparalleled by any other type of healing factor, meaning that even the Hayflick limit is bypassed because the telomeres are prevented from shortening, allowing a cell to divide infinitely. The suit thereby also renders aging impossible, as it can store the entire personality and body of its user should they ever part, therefore keeping the original user immortal in some way or another, allowing the user to take some other user's body for their own. So how far are we from smart materials that can help us heal and protect us from harm, including staving off death? Well, it's on its way, but don't expect it anytime soon. We are already developing nanomachines and synthetic medical administration mediums for assisting in wound healing, wound suppression, and critical life-saving care. Parafluorocarbon blood substitutes, for example, are chemically inert, but more effective than water or blood plasma in dissolving and absorbing oxygen in the lungs and then transporting oxygen throughout the body. PFCs remain in the bloodstream for about 48 hours. Because of their oxygen dissolving ability, PFCs were the first group of artificial blood products studied by scientists. They are the first generation blood substitutes. Unlike the red colored HPOCs, PFCs are usually white. However, since they do not mix with blood, they must be emulsified before they can actually be given to patients. PFCs are such good oxygen carriers that researchers are now trying to find a way that they can reduce swollen brain tissue and traumatic brain injuries. There is also research underway looking at a means and methods of using these blood substitutes to deliver wound suppression and healing promoting compounds that kickstart the body's own healing process, but this is still very, very much an early phase research. As for a compound or material that can interface with the body and prevent toxins and poisons from affecting the body, at current your best bet is just a well-stocked anti-venom lab, some catalyzing drugs or medical administrations of antibiotics. When it comes to staving off death, there is some emergent research looking into cryotemperature applications for slowing down the metabolic rate in critical life-saving treatment that increase patient survival odds and elongate the amount of time surgeons have to get to the task of piecing Humpty Dumpty back together again. But as far as implementing this directly into a chemical or compound that interfaced directly with the body, I think that's a way off human trials just yet. And finally... Energy critical. The nanosuit cryfibril has gained 20% more energy storage capacity, the ability to extract energy via solar, radiation, kinetic, and through carbon released by carrion, biologically dead corpses. So do we have materials that can harvest energy? Well, as mentioned earlier, IPMCs in actuation, sensing, and energy harvesting have a very broad bandwidth, to kilohertz and higher. As energy harvesters, EAPs have also shown good abilities by providing energy densities up to 0.4 joules per gram per cycle, 
often seen in applications where they're small generators integrated within shoes so each step generates energy. Moreover, they present some advantages over other techniques such as electromagnetic or piezoelectric as they have a low resonance frequency response and high elasticity which enable them to be used in situations where large displacements are available. But this is just through kinetic means. Extracting energy via solar and radiation is already possible. The company Medical Eyesight, founded and headed by Justin Hall Tipping, have created nanomaterials capable of capturing infrared radiation and converting it on a single membrane into an electron that can then be captured and stored for later release. Implementation of a material like this in tandem with an IPMC already gets strikingly close to the energy harvesting properties of cryofibril. As for absorbing carbon from carrion and converting that into energy, while we do have materials that can capture and convert carbon into fuel-like substances, we've yet to couple that with technology that would enable the direct electrostatic conversion of carbon to electricity. All in all, many of the properties that we see cryofibril demonstrating in-game is already well within the realms of possibility. The trick is getting a single material or composite material that performs all of these functions simultaneously without interrupting each other, and doing this at a price point that wouldn't make a single suit cost the same as a medium-sized country's GDP. Nevertheless, it just takes the continued and dedicated advancement of technology driven forward by passionate and motivated individuals to push these technologies in the right direction. There is still a lot of work left to do, but with current material science and the direction many of these fields are already headed, I wouldn't be surprised if something is already on the horizon. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, I look forward to what you have to say. Big shout out to the Accursed Hunter and all my other patrons who support the channel. If you're new here, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell icon, it really does help the channel out. And that way, next time I put a video out, you'll be notified the second it hits the shelves. And until next time we jump into the Zero Zero Multiverse, take it easy everyone.